Great. Thank you, everyone, for being here this evening for tonight's open mic. My name is Nia McAllister, and I'm the Public Programs Manager at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. And as we gather here today, it is essential that we acknowledge the times that we're living in and the circumstances that we're navigating. Moad stands with Black Lives Matter in recognizing and condemning the ongoing systemic violence against Black people. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, Tony McDade, Casey Goodson Jr., Patrick Warren Sr., Andre Hill, Dante Wright, Anthony Thompson Jr., Micaiah Bryant, and so many others who have lost their lives from police brutality and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. We want to acknowledge that Moad's commitment to racial justice is ongoing, and as such, we will continue to say their names to hold space and to honor these victims. I also want to acknowledge the spaces that we're occupying. While we're gathered virtually, many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent. And our institutions were founded on the exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose lands we're located. It is with deep respect that Moad acknowledges that even in virtual space, we here in what we call San Francisco and Oakland reside in unceded Chichenyo and Ramatush Ohlone lands. And we thank these indigenous communities of the Bay Area and beyond who've stewarded this land throughout the generations. And as I said at the start, we do encourage folks to share in the chat where you're joining us from. And if you do know the native lands that you occupy to share those as well. Um, and you can learn more about that by visiting uh, nativeland.ca. So today's space, this open mic is a place for us to recognize all of our emotions, um, to recognize our grief, our anger, our exhaustion, and to also find comfort and joy in each other's company. So I want to thank everyone who is returning to this space, everyone who's new in this space. It's a place where we always center respect um, when we share. And it's important, uh, as we hear from all of our performers tonight, uh, to continue supporting each other. Um, and so I encourage everyone um, who is in the audience to uh, really share affirmations throughout this evening. Uh, you're welcome to share lines in the chat that really stick with you that you hear, uh, use the reactions or air snaps and claps anything that you can do to really support all of our performers um, as it is a vulnerable space, um, bringing your work to, into, the, into the open mic. Um, so I'll just give a very brief overview of the flow of the event and then we'll get right into it. Uh, so I'm about to put the lineup in the chat for everyone and I'll introduce each person before they go up. Um, all our readers have about four minutes to share. Um, and if for some reason someone isn't in the room when I call them, but they return, they come into the room later, we'll circle back to them. Um, and I think with that, we'll get started. Um, midway through our open mic, we're gonna have a wonderful feature, James Cagney, which I'm very excited for. And so to kick us off, I would like to invite SK Williams up to the mic, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I want to wish everyone a happy Pride Month. Um, I'm very excited to be here, as always. And um, uh, I'm not reading a poem about Pride, but I do have a transgender child. And so I celebrate this month um, very much. And um, I want to dedicate what I'm going to read to him. My child uh, was born female, is now male. And so uh, we've gone through the whole process. And um, it's been quite... Um, uh, eye-opening and educational for me. So uh, this month is very special to our family and I want to um, acknowledge all folks who identify that way and send my love and prayers to um, to everyone. All right, um, I'm gonna start first with uh, a poem that is very recently written. Um, I'm starting a collection called uh, Putting on Stockings and it's really about dedicating um, uh, my writing uh, in that collection to the fat woman that I've become. <laughs> and it's not about the pandemic, it's just the fat woman that I've become, it's just life. So here I go, putting on stockings is my first piece. Um, farewell to the skinny girl inside this fat lady. I used to be you, I know I used to be you, but I'm not you anymore. Because now it's hard to put on stockings, like it wasn't before. And if it were still the time of my mother and my grandmother's, and all the women that came before me, I'd be searching for a girdle with which to hold back the proof of my aging and nation building, because it is what I have done. Why well, have done away with you, skinny girl? I'm a woman now, a fat woman, one whose womb has created other humans, 
one who was powerful. Yep, we nation building women, we create them and push them out of our own bodies and raise them. And even those who come out and look down on us for our copious waistlines, but the skinny girls lurking somewhere within, trying to remind us that we can go back because it's what America, um, no, the world and men expect inculcated with the aesthetics of Eurocentrism, forgetting that our role, amongst other things, has been to create humanity in all its glory. And so it will leave the evidence of that power from within without. So goodbye, skinny girl. And while I love, cherish, and remember you, I know I will never see you again. So I bid you farewell and cast you into the realm of fond memories where you can exist in your own world of my past, allowing me to embrace the beautiful fat woman that I have become. And that's that one. My next piece is called Transformation. And I'm using the word Kerub, K-E-R-U-B. Um, it is, uh, I'm a Garifuna from, from uh, Belize and Guatemala. And um, in, the, in Central America, the term Kerub is, uh, is equivalent to the N-word. It is what Garifuna people are referred to pejoratively. And so I'm gonna use that word. And I'm, a lot of my words in this poem are Garifuna words. I'm not gonna spend time um, translating them because I think they come across somehow. Here we go. Uh, transformation. Cherub. Though it sounded like cherub, the plump round babies that were the guardians of the soul and the heart, that played love games. It's anything but love that the actual word connoted, loaded with hate, loathing, and ignorance. It was typically spat out, cherub, with vehemence, like so much bitterness from the mouth of the speaker, vile with vile. It was meant to sting and corrode the soul of the recipient, casting him back into the darkness of inferiority where he was told he belonged. And sometimes it did its bidding, burning the heart, soul, and pride of the people of the cassava, the people of the plantain, and bimena, and hudutu falmon, and bimekakule, and fish with coconut milk. But in the long run, they did not heed the intention of destruction, and like their ancestors before them, they simply kept going playing their drums, the heart drum, the primero, the segundo, the tercero, in Dabuyeba, with their ancestors as guests and audience, and family who lay sleeping in hammocks, tied one above the other, then waking in the morning to once again continue the ways of their people, rocking and swaying and raising the heartbeat of the Uwayahong, dancing on Bemahani and Hugunhugun and Punta and Wanaragua, and sacrificing the damas, and guarding the doors of the temples to keep out evil, either by way of eye or menstrual blood summoning the ancestors with conch shells from far out to see Yurumai's side, east, waiting and hoping and praying for the evil word to disappear, taking with it the people who created it. And even though the utterers of the bad word remained, they prevailed, leaving the bad word behind them and became Garinangu, the cassava eaters from Yurumai's side, with their beautiful language and their beautiful customs and their beautiful music, that they will dance till the end of time, writhing to the drums on their way back to Yurume, from whence they were cast out, back to the land of the beauty of the rainbows, in the valleys, and in the realm of the Kalipuna, our ancestors. And that's that one. My last piece is, call, is untitled. I just finished um, writing it, uh, I don't know, probably about a month ago. Um, this piece is untitled. Uh, up, writing, waiting for the rain, thinking about me for a change and how I, wrought, I was wrought in this world, and from whence I came, and from whom I came, and who I became, have become, have been touched by, and whom I've touched, and how, and why, and the indelible marks I have left, and that have left, been left upon me with thoughts and words and love and cruelty that have been embedded into me, making me, me, hard, tough, rough on the outside, tender and vulnerable, and sad and girly and sweet and weepy on the inside, worn down from life, and the struggle of blackness and womanness, and borders, physical and mental, and divides that I can never bridge, entangling myself with so many who entangle themselves with me, seeking to define my identity. Have they truly seen me or I them? I wonder, I ponder, my power to keep being me, despite the wounds and the work and the words and the wars. So I sit here in my small world, surrounded by my contemplations and my pens and my head full of woes and my heart full of worries at the end of an era a warrior, a woman, a wounded soldier, waiting for the war to begin again. That's it, thank you. Amazing, thank you so much for all three of those pieces and always the story and the context that you share with your poetry. It's a wonderful way to start. Next up, I would like to invite Sylvia Blaylock up to the mic, welcome Sylvia. Hello everybody. 
Um, we'll go right in. This is remember when we were the revolution. Um, I would like to give honor to the Miwok land that I occupy. And I would like to give honor in light of Memorial Day to the hundreds of African-American soldiers, uh, naval men who died here during the Port Chicago explosion. May their spirits rest. Remember that time when the Romans got rowdy? That time we came together when our open skies grew cloudy? I braided my hair while you sharpened my spear. Then I sharpened yours while you trimmed away your beard. We came together beside a fire. We moved our love from this heaven to one that was safely a little higher, promising to return and retrieve, retrieve this precious treasure, this proof of our love coming fully together. Falling sands through an hourglass darkly. Remember when the waters ran dry, when former brothers made freedom more difficult to come by? We saved what we could and took what we could carry to protect my internal treasure. It was decreed we would need to marry. With my hair picked out, I am the November cotton flower set to bloom far too soon. The blush of summer that tints the snow and longing, drifts of future glow and dreams of the West where once many would go. Frosted mission to outlast the captive condition, breaking with both hands past. Faux alliance with the predilection for truths that appear self-evident. I am that and I'm also this. Springtime pre-show, fifth raised Afro, stacks fest groupie, baseline junkie, hippie girl funky, kaleidoscopic kaleidoscopically motivated, psychologically stimulated, philosophically X-rated, secretly worshiped and openly hated, circumvented too often negated. So full of myself I am, you when you were me and I filled you fully and you pulled me into you in ecstasy, and you made sure I knew how deeply you received me. When we fought the world, it was back to back. You had my back, I had your back. With each stroke, we joked, being up each other's backs. I danced in your adoration, blade and extension of come hither with a price. Indecision and derision resolved in a slice, almost reckless in my wanton bloodletting, eager to return to this good love I've been getting. Your power forfeited by pure devotion. We were the revolution and our song is still being sung. We were purposeful in our love and our side always won. That's that first piece. This piece is outskirts. Revolutions are waging in the mental realm, the evolution of caging the essential whelms to be among other human beings as the weather warms or dancing in the rain in East Coast thunderstorms, an undeniable urge to rub against a stranger's groove on a crowded dance floor, trying all your TikTok moves, digging through the boxes in your rented storage unit, pushing past the promised craft projects that you ain't doing. Your daddy's fender base and mama's old sewing machine case, you find that hidden storage bin, the one you pack your regrets in. You find your old hookah pipe and lounge receipt. Guess you better find something to save that in since you probably won't be going there again. There on the edge of the reality you live in lies the lies that lie close enough to meet your eye. There can be no doubt of the choice you make. Just curious about the self-destruct choice that you take. To vaccinate or not vaccinate? That's sort of the question. To outrun the Rona or attempt to circumnavigate? The point of entry from which there is no return. The choice of direction as which, as we watch those bridges starting to burn. And now we're sort of kind of knowing. Back that way, there's no going while something within us starts glowing. And once again, this ink starts flowing. And that's that piece. This next one is very small. It's from a collection that I'm doing called Love Offerings. Uh, I actually put my heart in a position to write love poems again. I'm as shocked and amazed as you are. I know. <sighs> Wait. 
sorry. The idea of love cannot be measured in heart-shaped boxes. Least we create a box large enough to encompass every passing morsel of thought that is even slightly flavored with unfathomable awe, with the unfathomable awe that your intelligence inspires. Sending you a candy store franchise isn't in the budget. May I offer a small token of my love for you with this all too little piece of what cannot be contained. The breath that bursts softly in the air, cool wisps under the street light, the sturdy echo of steps purposeful and moving forward, anticipation hovers like a lover, and all the night opens with the turn of a corner. A welcome light shines, holding place in time, bare light bulb yet begin to unwind, spending what remains of feeble restraint, coming down the corridor, walking, not quite running, to the familiar door, home light surrounds, loving heart found. That's it, peace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for all three of your poems. Um, and it, that last one was so joyful and so loving. <laughs> it was great to hear. Thank you. Next up, I would like to invite Aquila Lewis Ross. Welcome. Ooh, sorry, I was <laughs> having some technical issues. Um, hey, y'all, how y'all doing? Can I uh, do the share real quick, Nia? Yeah, of course. Okay, I see it. Okay. Um, Who got to catch my breath? Um, while I'm getting this um, awesome news to share with everybody, I, um, let's see, hold on a second. Dang, I'm having some technical issues. I have, today, I was getting some major news. Um, I, I am able to be um, approved to have surgery on my knee. I, uh, last year, I injured it in uh, July, 2020 and um, has some major issues trying to get, um, um, see the picture. Uh-oh, can you guys hear me? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, I can't see your screen. Okay, there, uh, okay, hold on. So I live in an area where the internet is really bad. And um, I might have to do the phone call. Do you want us to situation. circle back to you? But hold on one second. Mm, no. And so that's the good news. Yay. Um, I'm still waiting for some more good news. And I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to write that situation and the trauma that I experienced with it. Um, my body is in pain. I'm, I'm in pain every day, all day. And it's, it's not a good um so james cagney is my poet crush <laughs> now y'all know um he was the first person that i told about my um about that i wanted to write write a uh, write a book and <laughs> i am so grateful and so honored to have him be one of the people that um that read my book and gave a little blurb about what they what he thought about it. Thank you so much, James. Um, tonight, I'm going to start off with this poem. And it's called Spirit Friend. Um, Spirit Friend is an aphrastic poem written in its response to Janet Brock Hughes' painting, Merci. 
When the world becomes unbearable and conversation is impossible, I escape to the mystical to replenish. I don't have many friends. The circle was closed long ago. Don't tell me she's not real. I see her powerful wings glide into the starlit night, a horse with wings, improbable beautiful things. Oh, dare to dream idle, entranced in the heavens dance. Next one I'm going to do is called Double Standard. <clears throat> Have you ever desired a prison break? Systems driven to divide and conquer are pitting black against white since the dawn of time. To break the back of slaves who dare to dream of freedom. Break them out, the dungeons reek of blood and piss. If servants of God pray hard enough, will the prison doors open? Not all of us kill, not all of us hurt others. Many just wanna live walk away freely, breathing freely. What I'm going to do is called Rooted. Today, as I sit in my walker waiting for my ride, the rustling trees tease a sense of calm to my being. Nature has something to say and urges me to listen. But there's a tug of wood within, fire burning, and festers, like hot coals, an ulcer has metastasized, oozing goo to the root. The wind wants to blow it all away, waiting for another day, but days are short, and my patience is waning. I just want to write about nature and trees and family lines on Amster.com because they're still waiting to be recognized. Given what's due, 40 acres in a new preparation seems so far. Seeds don't have a clue how to grow. If the powers all around have something to say, the future bleeds death and evil continues to corrupt. How many stories must we tell for people to really listen? My time, my name is Lewis Ross. Thank you so much, James, for all of the everything. And I really do miss you. What's the name of it? I'm talking about people in the chat. like to take care of you. Thank you so much for sharing your poetry. And that photo is wonderful. That makes me so happy seeing everyone there. Next up, I would like to invite Ali Jones up to the mic. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here. Shout out James. I'm gonna do a few pieces. And um, this first one has a little bit of French in it, um, but I love that SK was like, yeah, you're gonna have to just flow with this language I'm giving you. And ironically, it's called in Delibil. And I heard you say that in, your, in one of your pieces, so. That was cool. When a sparrow cries, a soul flies. Silently in green pastures covered by warm rays beaming. Hummingbirds stand still in observance, in reverence for stars who no longer burn with the light that never fades. Generational grief in my bones, a hope that frays, dismembered memory, unspoken knowing in my hair, we say so much more. Shouting wild, vision blurred, the simulations tilting, we're in the matrix. Artifacts shrill of sacrifice, cloudy countenance. Regret creeps out of your eardrum, steady and resounding. White noise tingles straight to the temporal lobe. I hope you dance and sing. Les chansons de joie et amour profonde, pas de souci, pas de larmes, rien qu'une sourire qui allume. J'espère que tu vas bien, même si vous ne savez pas comment, indélébile. That is our first one. Thank you, everyone. 
This next piece, I've really been thinking a lot about Naomi Osaka and Black women and mental health and how we show up, how we hold space for ourselves um, and how the world doesn't really want for us to do that. Um, and, and this piece is really in honor of that, in honor of Black folks, Black women and our mental health and the fact that we need to hold space for it, that we need to be uh, standing up for ourselves, you know, and, and really doing the work, but also resting, you know, also walking away. <laughs> uh, and, and for us to remember that that is a part of how we take care of ourselves. Our first general was underground. Railroads couldn't compare to the depths of her mind. On a mission with a vision, Precision in the darkest cave covered by branches. Branches isolated by shame no matter where we go. The darkest storms. Up rooted black bodies, we continue to hide how we feel inside. Not equal, not well. What is being? The blood that drops. My heart that stops beating. Beating emotions and strength from this black vessel. Gasping for air craving help, someone to care, anyone to see that you are not invincible. Sold and conditioned, hanging on by a noose, no room to break loose from the labels you didn't ask for. Martyr complex, struggling to catch your breath under waters of expectation, bury your pain to survive. They can't relate, dissociate. Nuclear fractures, familial disasters, armed with silence, surrounded by never ending violence. Haven't we had enough? Faking like we're fine, struggling in pride, lynchings rules as suicide, told to hide our wounds inside. Self-inflicted crimes, the deepest roots. Admiral abolitionist writer, walls of information filled her books on a crusade for justice fighting to resist before a balled up fist. Truth of liberation, asphyxiation. We are the seeds of strange fruit, lemon trees in the summer breeze hemorrhaging from the root. Under the leaves of ignorance, our minds assassinated, our souls kidnapped, our bodies raped. There is no escape from the scars, this skin, when can we begin to heal, to feel, to just be free in the cage where birds wish to sing? Harriet, Ida, Billy, Nina, shape-shifting trauma into triumph, gardenias bloom across the street, cope or heal. Ultimately, it's all about how you deal the deepest roots Hold the darkest storms. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. That was such a beautiful tribute. All of the poems were beautiful, but that one really stuck. And what you just said about also the importance of rest and walking away. Um, I'm going to share a few poems now and then introduce our feature for this evening. So the first poem is entitled Pantone. The color of front lines and back doors. The color of their table and no seats. The color of first. The color of misnamed. The color of speak only when spoken to. The color of bootstraps. The color of glass ceilings. The color of blankets birthing statements. The color of token the color of outspoken, the color of unannounced fingers meeting braids, the color of only, the color of clutch purses and quickening paces, the color of the other side of the tracks, the color of missing, the color of pins dropped on conference room floors, the color of the unweighted table, the color of 63 cents, the color of switching tongues, the color of talking so well, the color of my word against yours, the color of being magic enough for everyone. 
Thank you. And in this sentiment of rest and breathing, uh, this next piece does not have a title, but it is along those lines. Muscle memory is only good for some things. One, swallowing. Two, how three sections of hair become a braid. Three, the number of days it takes for a bruise to heal on my skin. Four, changing an earring without looking. Five, guiding soft fingertips until they find my release. Six, the way home. I need to remember how to breathe again. I pause what I'm doing, prepared to focus my efforts on one simple motion. I breathe in and in and in and in and in and in and in, and, in, and still I cannot catch my breath. I attempt to yawn hoping to trick my body into filling my lungs with air I so desperately need. But she don't fall for my tricks. Instead, she says, pretend like you don't need it anymore. Then what? Who will you become? Meet her in the third heartbeat, the one that thinks this is an appropriate time for double dutch, as if air is something to jump into and not the very medicine tomorrow counts on. So I breathe in and in and in and out, free at last. And I'll read one more, which is another favorite, another piece that you know brings in the ancestors. This is entitled, In the Day Diamonds Are in the Water. The only time the ocean cut me, I bled stories. They said, what a beautiful yet terrifying thing it is to be free. They said, we have traveled years to bring you our names. We knew you'd forget them or worse, never recognize them in the first place. They said, remember me, unfold your tongue, gather in your hands all the cities your foremothers birthed freedom in scatter milkweed seeds in the wind and call us home. So waterlogged and weary, I bandage my wounds with diamonds and rise from sea foam memory, homebound as it were. I've never been far from the page. How else to learn what moonlight looks like through blue-eyed promises? Oh, but to be Sonia, to be Tony, to be wind in a cotton field scattering marigolds. I wish I knew Arkansas clouds like I do the lines on a palm, like I do the recipe for forgiveness. Joy is memory in the refrain, magic too hopeful to stay hidden. See the trick to befriending stories is listening after all. Yet sometimes belonging cannot be traced by tide lines or railroads carved out of the night sky, but rather dog-eared pages and overdue book finds. Having a library to owe things to makes one at home, right? So we write, we sing, we rename our story legacy before they claim we were never here in the first place. Find us on the page. As she said, this, this is the first battlefield we play on. Hear our words dance. And so we too leap into blissful surrender. And one day we will fly. And one day we will fly. Thank you. And with that, it is my honor to introduce our featured poet for this evening. James Cagney is a poet from Oakland, California. His poems have been published in Alta, Poetry Daily in the Patrice Lumumba Anthology of Black Writers on Liberation, among others. His first book, Black Steel Magnolias in the Hour of Chaos Theory, won the Penn Oakland 2019 Josephine Miles Award and is now available from Nomadic Press. James' second collection, Martian, The Saint of Loneliness is due in the fall. And I encourage everyone to check out the Dirty Rat blog for more. With that, welcome James. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Nia. That was a beautiful, beautiful poem, by the way. 
Um, love to everyone here in this circle tonight. Um, I adore and honor you and especially all my love and respect and heart and gratitude uh, to, to Nia, to Elizabeth and to all the staff at MOAD. Um, you know what, not just for providing this kind of like space for, um, for all of us during the uh, pandemic, but just for being um, incredibly supportive and active in the community since day one. Um, much love to you. And in doing this uh, reading tonight, I wanted to open with a poem that uh, will be, I guess, in the next book um, uh, uh, that was initiated in Moad's gallery. Um, I ended up doing a lot and creating like a lot of beautiful uh, pieces there. And I wanted to share at least one of them. So this piece is um, called Questions for Art Study. One, where does art come from? In what room does your art take place? The painting decides for itself to happen to assume every hue of blue and green layering the ocean, drawing pattern and feeling from the edges of space down to the rusted truck fender, mincing ministers into splotches of paint. The canvas writes its own story, inventing a Rorschach spill of unpronounceable letters, electrical language with different accents in each corner. It assumes the shape of a leaping lion with a golden aura, its ink blot land mass of color spreading while you watch it, blinking flirtation to its edges. I turn myself into a living canvas so that I may be rewritten. I turn myself into a living canvas on which my mourning can be articulated. When you raise your face to the heavens, the stars resemble nuts and bolts holding the sky together. I use what's ever around to build something that holds me together. Two, how should we inhabit ourselves within a museum or gallery? My charcoal sugar skin is not priced for retail. My children will not break out in crime. My family does not rhyme with bags of trash. My hair does not belong in your hands. My body is not your tool. I am not temporary. I am not your nigga. I am not a hashtag. I am not to be overlooked. I am not a victim. I am not a nail anxious for your hammer. I am. I am fragile, but will not shatter beneath your touch. I am. Look at my raised chin. Do you see the helm of an armed ship or the barrel of a loaded weapon? Look at my pride, my third eye of laser lights. Among this stolen furniture in the house of the oppressor, I stand eternal, supported by my own skin. I stand like the word I was once promised. I stand for those imprisoned by caskets. I will stand until my toes dissolve away into nonsense and impatiently scribbled signature. Three, what does it mean? This abstract painting is trying to recall something, trying to wake up. It knows the textured kiss of rust, breakfast of nipples, acrobatic black eyed peas dancing in a juke joint of hot broth, a thing wanting to be touched and touched back, surreal hallucinations in the bush, dinner of dark matter, bending lightning into letters, designing tribal tattoos, mountain ranges on the backs of elders, how you prep a plot of land for garden. Whatever isn't obvious is left to the subconscious and its weird random choices. Go back and look at the summer of 69. Tell me what's the color of love. Our ghetto missed the summer of love as we hadn't finished mopping up the blood of kings. Could murder be a form of art? Ask the police about the canvas of the street. These unfinished corners invite conversation, not criticism. Four, how much is it worth? Hostage to history and its habit of expectations. Look at what I've lost and tell me how much would you pay? Wait, what about these children? Why are you burying the elders before they're dead? 
ask yourself, who is running the gift shop in this museum of blood? Who will get the money? Who will collect the taxes? Who will laugh running to whose bank? It, how many receipts do we need to redeem the dead? How many empties before we've earned redemption? Where's our leftover change from this broken bill of rights? How much is enough? How much is too much? How much needs to be poured into your hands before you have the decency to say stop? Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, now for something slightly different. Uh, this is a uh, shout out to my last job, uh, shout out to hell and uh, shout out to you if you've ever had to sit at reception um, anywhere. And this is called uh, Interview with a Rose. Curved as a lip, pouting for a kiss. Sponge of sunlight, my tiniest filaments stand in ceremony to your song of color. Insects decide to walk the labyrinth of your perfumed path. Are you tickled by these cellular inspectors sipping your sweet wine of particulates? Would you have preferred to be a robin burdened with the sky's most unique song? Do you wish you were the moon, a whole planet of petals with an atmosphere of cologne, a dolphin bathing in the coral medicines of an oceanic garden? You itch when you are closed, shy and anxious, unconcerned with the weather, death, or dementia. You are the Earth's soldier of love and desire, yet, what do you know of it? Um, this piece is vaguely related um, and it is called Ode to a Desiccated Olive. And I dedicate this to the, uh, to the dude at the farmer's market in San Francisco. Um, here we go. When the Greek farmer plopped you plump and pregnant into my palm, he explained that when shucked of your meat and pounded gently, your pit excretes a mild antibiotic. Instead, I carefully stirred you between rudder and wave of my churning fingers, then let you exhale on the countertop like a weeping battery. Beneath your crown of leaves, a pubescent froth curls and naps with an acrid cologne of wood smoke left to, to simmer above time's distracted watch. You dimple and age into an amber compass, pointing like a nipple to the tongue's north star. I caress the grandmothered keloid of your consecrated surface so that you may come to Jesus on my altar of breath. Remind this tongue how once an engorged earlobe was combination lock, opening a soprano scale of moans. Unfold your map of flavors from vine to the secular intersection of oil and bread. Medicinal and mythical, you are a clairvoyant paragraph punctuated with blossoms of aspirin and eyelashes. If you take the place of my heart, let my veins be the roots of the tree that brought you here. This is like asking the rain in your lover's hair to fall back through the sky. Wow. And uh, since I'm at home and for the record, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, since I'm featured for this, this is gonna be hard to see, but I'm gonna try it anyway. That is that particular olive. And I think at this point, this thing is about seven or eight years old. Um, but there you go. <laughs> there you go. For the record, for the record. Um, this, uh, this next piece is uh, the uh, title track of the, uh, of the new book. Um, and um, this is called Martian. And uh, yeah, yeah, let's just do it. Martian.
After terraforming your night skin into a constellation of succulents, what else is worth exploring? Tongue sensors scan new geophysic language, ultraviolet fingers in orbit spinning, rockets propelling sticky dream nipples through a necklace of star clusters. Your black gibbous moons indecisive waxing, waning to and fro, sleep chanting canticles of milk behind a firewall of gene fabric. Chocolate meteorites of magnetite and silica, their solar nutmeg fusion, their viscous humidity, their orbital launch and vapor trail, spreading nets of munitions across radiant fields of sweet air and bedspreads like any man at war. Your pulsar fountains sparkling applause in comets, every asteroid impact crater blasting open, a seed head of color. I succumb to zero gravity, my pressure modules splintering, hurtling from heaven. I am touch illiterate. I search for words in my own mouth, my sweet and sour lunar crater, despite its post-apocalyptic emptiness. What word best describes an appetite for exploration of the unknown? Don't say desire. Longing is a pornographic surname in certain galaxies. So how to read a map of black holes? How to guess the temperature of your nearest astronauts? Have you touched an alien life form today? You got me about to come is how I begin most of my missions. You got me curious about what's out there and what flavor it assumes. I could live on your tang extract for eight days and name each molecule uniquely after jazz singers, insect species, Jupiter's moons. My mouth could revive you, tongue your keyboard of nerves, a soft valley of new life forms to restring your upright spinal base, psychedelic flowers to cultivate, weeping yeast for, for bread to bake, your eyelashes and lips bruise me from inside out. Find me sticky and fibrous, a moldy peach shattered by the kitchen floor. I am stone, I am mop, I am swarm of sugared water, a bee chopping the spires of the giant blue high stop lactating sugar. Did you know the origin for the word testimony? You know, back then words were valued just that much. What makes it really strange is how easy its legend is to believe. A row of soldiers willing to exchange their balls if their words fall impotent. Please note, history's second choice in oathing after balls is Bible. Perhaps Adam's balls were filled with the word of God or honey or space dust. I only know Adam's first prayer was, it's not you, it's me. Was God surprised by Adam as appetizer, his saintly rivulets of butter, his crunchy mass of breath, dust, and carnal itch? He named each animal, but there has never been a proper name for free-range loneliness migrating head to toe. And what did Adam eat? After naming each animal, did he lick it? check its seasoning? Who will feed us if we can't name what we want on a plate? Fuck you, my first waitress yelled. I'll need tabs of Viagra and an extension cord, I stage whispered. Me, a quasar light years from rapture, sitting in a spaceship as if awaiting to be accepted by alien officials. I had no Voyager discs to DJ or heartbeats to sample, just this astronomer's pubic canopy, its rainforest of fresh and fruity antibiotics. Use me to keep warm like how you once used a campfire. You'll need dry, fine tinder and friction spinning and grinding to work the flame up the ladder until embers awaken their bright red eyes and weep smoke. There's been weeping but no one has touched me and triggered fire. No touch at all except to shove my shoulder as they shower past blind. If I remain in people's way, I should be touched again. Even if touch rhymes with choke or punch or shove, it's still touch. 
I see sex as a kind of conversation with various sticking points. Both my past lovers have been mutes with mouths full of mirrors or judges who gavel on over guilt and sentences. How might you describe your first love? Clumsy or clever? Stupid or selfish? Or sad, sad, sad? The sun was first described as an erupting volcano falling from the sky, magmatic, hot to see, inflamed, brilliant, cast gold luminous and swelling upon its approach, darkness parting in star-crested waves. The sun itself described the flavor of darkness, how one might explain skin first tasted, skin not your own, foreign and savory, its seasoned cells sweating oyster water. Swallowed flames reheat the body's forgotten science and wasted fertility. Now close the cargo doors of the shuttle. My engine begins firing in the orbit burn. Such complex algebra just to land in welcoming arms. I emerge from your shadow dumb as an eclipse, but at least relieved. The world has remained the same. It is me made glossy with newness and unanswerable questions. My life, untouched, unloved, undercover? No, alive and throbbing and alone. Wow. Doing that is like um, running a marathon, practically. Uh, how about, uh, I, I'm thinking, how about five more minutes? Is that where I'm at? OK. The next. Um, what I'd like to do is a couple of poems for, uh, for my father and for the uh, older men in my family. <sighs> this first one is called uh, House of Slams and Hollers. And I dedicate this to my father's uncle, Eileen Jordan. Who occupies the storefront houses at the crossroads? Shotgun houses like abandoned churches. One house slouched behind the musty aroma of trees. Windowsill radio chatters like a bird on caffeine. The living room smells swampy with ashes and bottle caps. Kitchen of vintage graveyard shift coffee, boiled viceroys, cicadas with exoskeletons of brandy and chickens chained in the backyard. Night turns over haunted with moths, air cooled with shuffled decks and howling hounds missing hell. The methane of certain ghosts gets drawn like window shades, dealt in, poured shots at this place where the road crosses its legs like a gentleman. Here lies the uncharted territories of some blues, stigmata blues, razor blade blues, Blues for lips just out of reach. Blues screaming blouses of plaster down bedroom walls. Choirs of apocalypse blues ignite the red wicks of their tongues. Sing harmony to calm Blue Gill River for Saturday's baptism of hot lead. Dawn rises with fire on its mind, takes off its top hat. Names smile from its mouth in comics, false crosses. Anything not already on the ground, holding on, praying, done grabbed a guitar and a shotgun and ran. Um, and uh, why, yeah, you know what? I'll end uh, with this piece. Um, I was introduced to the word toguna, which is a West African word meaning a, a kind of like meeting, a meeting house, a community house. And I guess it's primarily intended for older men in, uh, in the community. And that word became valuable to me because I used to think about how my father used to spend mysterious evenings and afternoons away from mom and me um, down the street. And it took me a long time to write a poem about that. And here you go. So this is called Toguna at 61st and Market. And uh, this, is, this is my last poem. My father's blood followed the current of the street. Spawned too, apparently, 
Anytime daddy wasn't home, he'd be down the street, had a secret life there where they breathed blue 90 proof air. In those rooms, his heart defrosted, circled his chest like a catfish. Down the street was some nine blocks south and a reservoir of filth to my mother's taste. Bottom feeding old drunks, noodling nothing in an open garage, a designated RV, a mama free living room. Drunks from my dad's longshoreman days, haggard and grand drunks, fallen bones and bullshit drunks, a grapevine of drunks, a bullpen of drunks, a stagger of drunks, burdened with crossroads prophecy and blues harmonica waggling in like bees from fresh nectar juke joints. From the hour school let out till long after the sun hung over a noisy, belligerent sea. A kind of sea shimmered between the old men, a black whiskey sea, a sky latticed with lightning Hopkins, a murder of old crow bourbon, unscrewed and squawking. Right on. Thank you guys so, so very much. My love to you eternally, everybody. And I look forward to listening to the rest of the open mic. Right on. Thank you so much, James. That was an incredible set. And as oh, we, were, you. We, were, <laughs> we were talking in the beginning, and I said, I think we want to hear all the poems. And you said that could take <laughs> hours, but we would sit here and listen. That was that was incredible, James. Um, Thank you. And I do want to quickly ask if there's other uh, either open mics you're doing, any features, any other projects people can support or uh, tune into. If you can share those. That would be wonderful. Uh, let me think about it. I think I'm basically out of work right now as far as poetry goes. This is my last major event. I can't think of anything, but I'll let you know. Well, that's that's a sign, everyone. Book book James for your next event. <laughs> but if you do th if you do think of anything, please do put it in the chat. Will do. Wonderful. Well, we're going to continue our evening with the remainder of our open mic readers. And I'm going to put the second half of the lineup in the chat. We'll have the same flow as before. Each open mic reader will have, will have four minutes to share, and I'll read your name um, to introduce you. So to start us off, I would like to invite Norm Maddox up to the mic, who is our last open mic feature. Welcome back, Norm. <laughs> wow. How you doing, Nia? Doing all right. Good to see you. OK, OK. As a matter of fact, I'm just hoping that the next voice I hear is not James Cagney coming out of me. Wow, that was fantastic. Wow. OK, so I have a couple of pieces here. And um, this is uh, in honor of the teachers and their students. Uh, this is called My Memorial Day. A day on the annual calendar. A day to remember and honor warriors fallen in wars for liberty. Wars fought for freedom from the need for defense. In defense of freedom to think freely. Warriors on the front line willing to go to battle against ignorance every day, willing to risk disequilibrium, knowing the payoff is something new, something hard earned, something unthought of before, an unexpected return on the investment of thinking and thinking about thinking. My students learn that thinking is something up a barrier laden fear bidden mountain of unknowns and curious things risking the derision of peers like geek and nerd are bad things to be my students are warriors against their own status quo no assessment can measure courage reflection and resilience my students will always be challenged to think outside Side the cocoa because society already doesn't expect a straight answer from you. And students tell the newbies, you know, he's going to ask you, why did you think that? 
I would go into the battle against ignorance and bullying with any cohort of students, feeling the persistent urgency to make mistakes we can all learn from faster. Answers don't matter. The thinking behind the question is de querer saber, the want to know. Memorial Days create hope and sustain my faith. I am honored to be a teacher in your class. Next piece. Uh, this is some, something new. I have a couple of new pieces and, and, and James is on point here. One verse. What parts of English do they learn from you? What do you teach? It matters more what's between the lines. We get to blur the lines. We get to skew barriers. We like to play with fighting words. We get to embed beginnings in long endings. We get to write poetry because of that vitality. Being present for the meeting of universes, the ones on the outside, and the innerverse between the marrow. Awake, fuck woke to it all. Able to inspire change in some dimension, in some anybody, in your own body, is the work of translating stardust, transmuting dark energy, dark matters, the unseeable, the unmanageable. Words plant seeds in concrete on purpose, intend for cement to decompose and armored hearts to soften before roots grow deep enough to anchor free dreams beyond what happens next. Next piece. Who would I ask? I have to say that I am a poet because I name myself. I have to say permission isn't given because you ask for it. I have to say power has to feel generous that day to share permission before the pressure to release the pop corks, pops like a cork. I have to say power doesn't want to exercise conscience being asked permission while no is the default. I was raised by good manners, where language never got vituperative. I was raised by an apple cart that never got upset because it had four square wheels, four corners spread so far apart, it never worried about taking up too much space. Understanding that, my place would never fit the space granted to me as a remnant of my village. Understanding that humans covered the land like blades of grass. Make no mistake, we belong to this land before greed dug, its, dug into our roots, harvesting memories, regurgitating bile added traditions, inventing the power of ownership. What poetry teaches, stardust charges us to recreate the next moment. What poetry teaches now becomes another big bang, the next universe in your path. Take one step towards love and you might just take two steps towards the solution to fear. Peace. That was wonderful, Norman. Thank you so much. I love your making pieces as always. Wonderful. Well, next up, I would like to invite Tim Powell up to the mic. Jean Powell, are you here? I think I'm. I think I'm here now. Wonderful. <laughs> I, I'm not a technical person. <laughs> So the fact that I'm on this little machine at all is some kind of miracle. 
So thank you to Moad and to Mia and thank you, James Cagney. I'm going to read first a new one. I have two poems. Dry Bones Remembered, Philadelphia 1985 is the subject matter. Dry bones free of marrow, dry bones in a shoebox, small space for a lively child. It did not matter. She did not matter. They did not matter. Killed in a police action, 1985, Philadelphia. No bullet pierced her young body. A helicopter dropped a bomb on a compound. Can you imagine? Yes, please do. Hook and ladder vehicles descended on the conflagration. Police said no, stand down, let it burn. Let the compound burn, let them burn. Six adults and five children, let them burn. This is a police matter. We have unqualified immunity. A neighborhood burned to the ground. Free of life, free of hope, their fire seared bones were free of justice. Add these dry bones to hundreds more, once black skulls stored in the Penn Museum at a major university. Dry bones, simply black, supplied by grave robbers in America and Cuba. Mike was six when he escaped the fire that day. He remembers, he remembers Delicia who was 12, how they laughed, how they played and climbed trees. Her academic handlers roam free of such memories, display her tender bones in cavalier style. Stored in a shoebox, this lively child dressed up a video at Princeton, Ivy League, real bones, adventures in forensic anthropology. The only college experience she ever will have. Dry bones, dusty shelf. Everyone handled her, everyone knew. For 36 years, she huddled in that shoebox. They all knew. Her bones did not matter, since she did not matter, since they did not matter. But now we all know she will be claimed and taken from that dusty shelf. They want to do the right thing when all is said and done, now that every possible profit has been gained. For 36 years, she lay on a shelf, charred and broken, the kind of breakage our world has forgotten, dry bones sifted and sifted and filmed without hurry. Her spirit waiting, waiting quiet as time itself for a hint of remembrance. And my last poem from my new collection, Deeply Notched Leaves, which I have to get over to the museum. Writing memoir is hard. You knock on doors nobody wants to open. Let the past stay past under padlock and leafy moss blankets. You knock on those windows with tiny panes. Memory won't let you in there out of pity. Too rough on your consciousness. Emotions likely to rile up and stomp. Writing memoir is hard. You have to go really slow, walk along dusty pathways with a watering can, stop to take in deeply notched leaves, hear the sighing of tree branches in the wind as they recall close cousins cut down. You go home and chant as candles glow. You hold jars of beets your grandmother canned, caress earrings blue and silver your mother left before she walked away, and that brown radio in an antique store, just like the one your dad listened to, you stand and whisper to it, close your eyes and imagine, simply imagine where he might be buried. Writing memoir is hard. A gray stone library beckons and you climb its steep and winding staircase with urgency, at least you did before the plague year. You stroll along the shelves and touch book spines. When one touches you back, you open and read. Memories slip from printed pages, rifle through your curls, nestle in your crimson shawl. 
Close to the bay, you walk the Embarcadero, ancestors float in, waving from fishing boats a thousand miles from Great Lakes territory. You recall fish fries, lamps hung from trees, and laughter lighting up sundown shadows. The tide goes out before, wait, before they hook a place in your memory. On public transit, electric bus and metro car, people parade past and you inspect for that trace of yesterday others find in family Bibles and albums bulging with photos posed and candid. A stranger smiles and greets you by your name, unknown out here on the West Coast. What are the archangels trying to tell you? Start with the little girl first. You know, the one with long braids, on the cover of February Voices. Find her again. Won't be easy, but gain her trust and the cadences will emerge. Will outshine manufactured dreams, break through your silence. This memoir business is hard, but where else are you to go? Thank you. Thank you, Jean, for both of those pieces. Those were absolutely beautiful. And it's so wonderful remembering when you were a feature when we had this open mic in person as yes. well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, I'd like to invite Sarai Bordeaux. Welcome, Sarai. Hi, everybody. Um, I just have one thing to read. And nothing ever has a title, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, hmm. At this point, I'm just trying to protect my enough. It seems like I am most able to mark parts of my life by which enough was going on at the time, not black enough or cute enough, then cute enough, but only for a black girl, then not smart enough. Where which the subsequent years were spent trying to make sure people didn't think I was dumb. They thought I was dumb anyways and said as much to my face. Then I was too smart, knew too much, a bully with my words deflecting and projecting, needed to stop intellectualizing things so much they said, but at this point, not good enough is confusing, too confusing to keep carrying, especially when the enough game keeps changing wasn't strong enough and now it's legit to be vulnerable. Thank the black goddesses above me for these tears and the ability to speak through them. That took practice. No thank you on the tissue. My garments need this magic for later. A reminder, change is constant. So is my self worth at this point. Enough is enough. My enough is enough. It doesn't matter that I can't always keep it in line because I'm having them all can't ever focus or keep a routine. It's because before I build my most perfect day, uh, the most perfect day of my most perfect life, I needed to start with rest with what is most important, which is there is no compromising this spirit, my cup, this vessel, versatile is one thing, flexible is another, doormats are still another, open to criticism, still yet another. And still none of these things will come close ever again to this core. Yoga and sound baths can come after that. Thank the black goddesses again for this second sobriety. I have been stuck in a space of thinking that I needed to change when in fact, I'm just needing to to become more accepting of all of this, all this mess, all the times and all the places, all the falling off I did, the lingering too long to all the everything. It's not that I needed those experiences, those experiences needed me. Embarrassment and shame are cages as is the fear of what I haven't started yet as is the image of perfection when I know that mother, that my mother, father, God has loved me ugly, crying, stubborn, cheating, wrong, 
vein, yes, the universe can still create so much balance and grounding from this mess, so much sacred geometry out of so much chaos, diamonds out of all this darkness, then I can love my mess, holding it tight, I am a fucking gem, this universe and I are one in the same, and that is so beautiful, because the universe cannot be the center of itself, so who gives a fuck about that night or that time, or maybe the universe can be its own center, in which case I can order that shit forgotten forever. It doesn't matter how I've been because who I am now only wants to protect this space. It is safe in here where I have decided to land, not physically on this earth, but in my body this spirit, honest, kind, hardworking, but not for no reason, not for your reasons, with a purpose that is okay, I haven't found yet fully. My goal right now is happy mornings, sunshine, fish, finishing what I have chosen to start so I can focus on something else. I am impersonating no one. I am nobody's imposter. I am working on a syndrome to describe some happy shit, tired of pathology. There is nothing wrong with me that I can't use. This one doesn't have a name yet, but it is marked my, by my ability to see everything right now through a lens of love, meta, you and I are here, but I am not picking up your shit and I am not going to ask you to carry mine either. The symptoms are asking questions instead of writing and dying. Spontaneous no's out loud just to keep that muscle tight. They are scared and are doing what needs to be done anyway. The, mes the medicine to enhance this syndrome and not squash it is treating relationships like the joys they are, treating myself like the joy I am. Instead of all the work that needs to be done all the time, the side effects of this medicine are realizing that though relationships do take work, they need not be built on working trauma, not needing to fear my moods or bad days, not trying to keep my good days either, keeping my word, realizing that proximity will not save me, who and what I know will not save me. Justice adjacent is not a thing I'm trying to fuck with, but liberation is not what people are saying it is either. My enough is enough, but it is up to me to decide what that really is. Best of my enough is another pill that needs swallowing, but right now I'm down to be taking my own medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Sarai. Wow, that was incredible. I'm always so impressed by, by your words and your poems. So thank you for sharing that. So to close this out this evening, we have the wonderful Tarita McKell. Welcome, Tarita. Wow, thank you. Oh, Sarai, baby. Mm, mm, mm. And James, Norma, well, everybody that I, you know, you know how we roll. Everybody got some medicine to feed each other. And uh, we just, we feed each other. We feed each other. We give, we take this medicine. Um, okay. And Jean, Jean Powell, I have not heard, that was just extraordinary. I had not heard you in a while. That was beautiful. That's amazing. So uh, let me get to this. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to do um, the two, two short pieces. I think they're short. But I'm just listening to things relating to language. And um, I tend to write a little differently uh, because I'm not, uh, well, I'm good enough. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm good. I'm, I'm just, OK. Liberant spell. Sticks and stones break bones and homes, take fish hook stars from eyes. 
altar, altar, ark, ark, covenant, government, enterprise, enterprise, paradise, pair of dice, profits, profits, sale, sale, worship, worship, pray, pray, peace, peace, sun, sun, parish, parish, jewel, jewel, good God. Why alter earth's altar? Silence the ark for an ark. Why douse sacred fire of every kind? Who enters prize for this enterprise? Why did the son of the sun worship with warships? Pray on those who pray for peace. Set sail for sale of peace with paradise for a paradise. Government's profit gamble with profits. Covenant of light. Will jewels perish? in parish of jewels, whose good is sacrifice for the concepts of God. And because the sun has been out and I've been enjoying that I'm doing my son, I'm sure some of you may have heard this, but it, it helps me where I am right now. My son, I will speak for you. Those scriptures masked your testimony from eyes that once knew your light, watched you walk upon waters, oversee floor, fauna, mammal, animal, bird, and sea creature, obey your season's will, my son. Your garden legacy deed you master, alchemist, chef, cook, sorcerer of elements, you feed multitudes, flavoring nature's seed womb my son. Why falsify your records? Hide your light? Cut circuitry from innocent eyesight, masquerading one vow well with idol sacrifice, my son. Unclean spells stray from holy wellness, creates hell for pathologic wealth, degenerates generations, my son. An icon reads, think not I come to bring peace. I come not to bring peace, but a sword. Why destroy peace in your wheel that is done? You are the reason life on earth rolls through heaven. While greed eats away trees, disconnects energies, deviates gravity, habitats for humanity, erodes truth, integrity, destitute, disputing life roots. They brainwash memory, branding you secondary, awaiting a Messiah as though your soul, our light is not required, my son. Too many religious saviors, too many competitive death plans, too many eyes look away from your radiance to revere a rote man, my son. I need not wait for your return. Your morning light never ceases for what I yearn. You are my testimony, my sojourn, my life, my son. You not born of man or woman, you true light of this world. You, my son, are holy read, are spark of light that never sleeps in heart and lung as we breathe. My son, my omnipotent one, eyes will always rise to acknowledge you. Thank you. Thank you, Tarita, for taking us home with those poems. And as you said, there was literally so much medicine in this space tonight. Thank you to everyone who shared poetry this evening. And Thank my book, uh, Synchronicity, the Oracle of Sun Medicine is at MOAD. 
Yes, it is. So I recommend everyone get, get a copy of that book. It's absolutely incredible. And I wanna thank James for being our wonderful feature this evening. Again, everyone who was here in the audience listening and supporting all of our readers. This really is a wonderful space to all share in together. And it is not the only one. <laughs> this is one of many programs um, that we are doing at MOAD. Um, this open mic series happens every two weeks. And so our next one will be on June 17th. And we have the wonderful Thea Matthews as our feature. So very much looking forward to that. Um, we'll be sharing the links to that event in the chat. Um, I encourage anyone who would like to read and be part of that lineup to sign up on the event. And if you are able to continue supporting the museum, both by showing up to our programs, if you are able to give financially, we do appreciate that. Uh, you can make donations through our website, which is moadsf.org. Um, or we also have information in the chat uh, by donating via phone. If you text the number 56512 and type moadsf, um, you're able to make a donation that way. And the last thing is we do appreciate hearing from you. Um, so if you are able to take a couple moments following the program to quickly fill out our program survey, um, we love to hear your comments and thoughts about how you experience the programs. Um, so we know what to keep doing. Um, so thank you all again um, for being here, for participating. And I hope to see you all at our next open mic in two weeks. Take care, everyone. Take care, everybody. Be safe out there. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it's you. a great show, Nia. Congratulations, thank James. You. you were great. Thank you, James. Yes. I mean, that was fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, James Cagney. And thank you, Nia. The space is always so warm and embracing, I'm telling you. Mm. Thank, thank you, you to everyone.